Good morning. So good to be with you all this morning. Great to see you here today. The Lord is good, and we are very blessed this morning that we have this opportunity to worship Him together. Now, faith is the assurance of things hoped for, Hebrews says, the conviction of things not seen. By faith, our ancestors received approval. Indeed, without faith, it is impossible to please God, for whoever would approach Him must believe that He exists and that He rewards those who seek Him. Let's pray together as we begin this morning. Dear Lord and Father, we thank You, Lord, for the God that You are, and Lord, we believe in You, we, we trust in You, and, and we place all of our hope in You this morning, Lord. God, I pray that as we consider how we can be faithful people to you, Lord, that you would, that you would bless our thoughts and, and guide our thoughts and, and teach us to be like you. Lord, help us to learn from the people who have gone before us. Help us to learn from the lives of those that are recorded in Scripture and help us to learn from one another how we can, how we can follow you more closely and how we can approach your throne more faithfully, and how we can be like your son, Jesus. Lord, we thank you most of all for Jesus and, and what he did for us, the way that he lived his life, the blessing and gift that he was of salvation to us. And, and Lord, we, we thank you that, that he died for us and that he rose again from the grave. And it's in Christ's holy name that we pray this morning. Amen. In 1845, an expedition led by Sir John Franklin left England in search of the Northwest Passage. This morning, I want to tell you about the things they carried. Now, the Northwest Passage, as many of you may remember, all of our geography buffs probably know, is a path that goes through the Arctic Ocean over Canada into the Pacific Ocean. It was the key, England thought, and, and many other countries at that time thought as well, it was the key to faster trade routes to the Pacific. That way you didn't have to go around all the way down south past Africa or all the way down south through the Atlantic past South America. This was the shortcut. It was, in fact, the waterway to riches and glory and faster trade. But it was no easy journey getting there. In fact, in 1845, the Northwest Passage, it was not even really known where it was. It was not even really known whether it truly existed. There was no map to show how to get there. Nobody really knew exactly what was up there near the North Pole and the freezing Arctic Ocean. In May, uh, May 19th, actually, of 1845, the Franklin Expedition set out to find exactly what was up there in the Arctic Ocean. They embarked from the western coast of England uh, together in two ships, 138 men. You can see this is actually a drawing of the two ships that they took. Uh, they were both quite large ships with three large masts apiece. And both of them also had two, uh, they both all had auxiliary steam engines attached to them which ran on coal that they could use at times when the wind wouldn't carry them on the journey. They carried with them three years' worth of food supply for their journey. That's how long that they expected their journey to last. But interestingly, they only carried with them 12 days' worth of coal supply for their journey. Instead of coal, they chose to carry other things. For one, they carried books, lots of books, 1,200 volume libraries were found on each of these ships. They carried with them a, a hand crank organ and a box of sheet music. They carried with them china place settings and, and fine wine goblets and sterling silver knives and forks with ornate designs on their handles, Victorian designs, the crests of their families, the crests of the officers of the group. They didn't even bring any special clothing for the Arctic conditions. They wore instead the uniforms of Her Majesty's Navy. And believe it or not, they didn't find the Northwest Passage. 
Uh, they left England in the days of May when it was turning to summer, and there was a great parade for their grand departure on this grand journey, and they came packed with the luxuries of home with them. Two months later, a British whaling captain spotted them near Greenland. 160 years later, search parties are still collecting pieces of the Franklin expedition, pieces of their ship, uh, pieces of their uniforms, a backgammon board that they brought with them, and sterling silverware scattered across the frozen sea. First heard about that expedition, the, the Franklin expedition, in an essay I was reading by an author named Annie Dillard. She writes an essay and she talks about several expeditions to the Northwest Passage, like that one, or, or other expeditions also that went toward the North Pole. And it's interesting to me the things that these people carried with them along their journeys. In the essay, Dillard describes several voyages like the Franklin Expedition where they didn't really carry the things they needed for the journey. Instead, they carried with them the luxuries of home. They carried their teacups and their libraries and their organs. I read about one group who actually lugged along with them a printing press so that they could produce and distribute their own little weekly newsletter as they went to the North Pole. I read about another group, an American group, who brought with them boxes and boxes and a huge flag from their fraternity in college that they wanted to put at the North Pole. Not surprisingly, these groups were not very successful in their journeys. When they reached the frozen Arctic Ocean and all of the dangers that came with it, they rarely arrived at the place they set out to find. Now, I tell you those stories this morning for two reasons. And I'm sure that you're probably on out ahead of me thinking about what those reasons really are. The first one pertains to where we're going, because in the next couple of weeks and the weeks to come, we are together starting a journey. Uh, next week, we'll be turning to the story of Genesis and talking about how we can be faithful to God along the journey in our lives. The stories that we're going to be reading from Genesis are the stories of a family who is literally journeying to an unknown place, journeying into an uncharted territory with no map to guide them, just following the promise that God had given them. And I think that we can learn something from the faith of this family as they travel to the place that God has led them to go. And so, for the next coming, coming weeks, I want us to talk about these people in Genesis and the way that they traveled, the things that they carried, and the, the hopes and troubles that they faced along the way. I hope it can be helpful to us as we consider our lives in this journey of faith that we're on together. So that's the first reason that we start here this morning. It pertains to where we're going next. The second relates to where we've been so far. These past two weeks we've been talking about this question, what is faith? And for the past two weeks we've looked at two now biblical images for what faith is like. Images that help to give us kind of a shape or a tangible image for what faithfulness really looks like. Two weeks ago we considered how faithfulness is like a garden. Last week we considered how faithfulness is like a marriage. And this week, once more, I'd like to give us one last image to hold on to before we start our journey through Genesis. And, and that is that faithfulness itself is a journey. Faithfulness is like a journey. Here again, the, the roots of this analogy come from Scripture itself. And as you may suspect, they actually come from what we might say is the, the greatest or most famous chapter of Scripture or definition of faith that there's ever been. Hebrews chapter 11. We began reading it together earlier. And what you notice if you spend any amount of time with this chapter is that Hebrews chapter 11 describes faith in terms of motion. It describes faith in the language of a journey. For example, in verse 6 that we just read, uh, when it talks about faith, it describes approaching and seeking God. Without faith, it is impossible to please God, verse 6 says. 
For whoever would approach him must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who seek him. So you see that the invitation to faith is an invitation to seek God. It is belief set into motion in our minds, in our lives, in our actions. Uh, Faith is the act of pursuing. It is the act of approaching God with all of the determination that we have. That's the sort of faith, Hebrews says, that pleases our God. And so from this point forward in the chapter, Hebrews chapter 11, what we see is that the author of this chapter is building on this idea that faith is belief set into motion. And so he turns to Abraham in in verse 8. By faith, Abraham obeyed when he was called to set out for a place that he was to receive as an inheritance. And he set out not knowing where he was going. By faith, he stayed for a time in the land that he had been promised as if living in a foreign land, not at home as a stranger in a foreign land, living in tents. Why? Why does he do this? Because he looked forward to the city that had foundations, whose architect and builder is God. Skipping down, it says that Abraham, through what he did, made it clear that he was seeking a homeland. That's why he went. You can hear that repeated imagery. By faith, Abraham set out By faith, Abraham looked forward. By faith, Abraham was seeking a homeland. Faith, as Hebrews 11 puts it forth for us to see it, is like a journey. To be specific, it's like Abraham's journey. Faith is believing in God like Abraham did. Believing in God in such a way that moves you. That moves you in the direction that God is beckoning you to go, which is, of course, unto Himself. Faith is this journey that leads us toward God, that follows His promises and finds in God's presence a home. Later on in this same chapter, we see more uh, figures of faith from Israel's history. Uh, The chapter turns to Moses, and we see again this uh, this same repeated theme of journeying emerge again. As with Abraham, the faith of Moses is a faith, a belief that's set into motion in search of the promises of God. By faith, verse 27, Moses left Egypt in spite of what? Unafraid of the king's anger. By faith, verse 29, Moses and the people that were with him passed through the Red Sea as if it were a dry land, in search of that promised land. Like Abraham before him, Moses also embarked upon this journey toward a promised home. And when Scripture reflects on this journey, what they say about this journey is that it was faith that brought him there. I think it's pretty clear, isn't it, that this famous chapter about faith, this unique chapter in Scripture, describes faith as being like a journey. And I'm so glad that it does. I'm so glad that it does because I think that it's a great way for us, a helpful way for us, to think about and understand what faith really is for several reasons. Number one, this language of talking about a journey helps us to see that faith is a matter of seeking. Faith is a process of arriving at a destination. It's not just the end result or the final conclusion. It's not just a set or a collection of facts or beliefs that we consider our understanding, but it's really a movement toward that understanding. Or better put, it's a movement toward God and toward the promises that He's given us. You notice in this chapter that it is not Abraham's arrival that is labeled as faith. No, in fact, it's, we're told that Abraham and his children didn't really truly arrive at the destination they set out for. All of these died in faith without having received the promises. But from a distance they saw and greeted them. So you see, it's not arriving, it's setting out. 
It's journeying toward. That's what Hebrews refers to in Abraham and calls it faith. I think that this can be a, a healthy way for us to look at our own faith as well. Because what it means is that faith is gained and produced and learned and grown along the way, along the journey in our lives, as we continue to seek the reality of God. If you think about it like this, in Hebrews 11, faith is not like a medal that you win at the end of a race. Faith is more like the strength that you gain through running the race. Faith grows like muscle, even when, or especially when, it burns and aches with use. And the more that we run, and the further that we go, the stronger it can become. There's strength to be gained through the journey. And what that means is that our lives, our daily lives, are infused with meaning day after day because every day we have the opportunity to continue to seek God in faith. Every day we have the opportunity to dig deep within ourselves and press forward toward that city whose architect and builder is God, knowing that each step that we take by faith will produce the strength for the next step. A second thing that I think that we gain from this journey image. We learn the sobering fact that if faith is like a journey, then it's not an easy one. It's not an easy journey to take. If you think about Abraham and the journey that he's called to take, if you think about Moses and the journey that he embarks upon, these are journeys into an unknown future in search of an unknown place without a map with only the promise of God to guide them. That's not an easy thing, but I think that it is a good picture of what faith can be like and what faith can feel like for us sometimes. After all, as Christians, we also deal with the unknown and the unseen aspects of our faith. The search for God inherently implies a search for something beyond us beyond our grasp that we're, that we're moving toward. Uh, no one has ever seen God, the Gospel of John says. It's only through Jesus that He was revealed in a way that He could be seen and heard and touched. We as Christians deal all the time with the unknown. The unknowns of our future. The unknowns of our lives. The unknowns of our health. The unknown place that we are, are, are planning to move toward that unknown place that God has promised us, like Abraham, like Moses, we journey into the unknown. And that can be challenging. That can be really tough. I mean, as Christians, we really believe that God is true to His promises, that God keeps the promises that He gives to us. But it can still be hard when life is difficult. It can still be challenging to us to believe that. That doesn't mean that we don't from time to time wonder or, or waver in our faith. As we look to Genesis in these upcoming weeks, I think that what we're going to see is that even people like Abraham went through some of these same struggles. Even people like Abraham had to deal with those unknown things on their journey toward the thing that God had promised them. But what really is important is that in spite of that, people like Abraham endure. In spite of the struggles of the journey, in spite of how difficult it may be, people like Abraham press on. If Abraham had been thinking of the land that he had left behind, Hebrews says, he would have had an opportunity to return. All the other ones after him the same way. But as it is, they desired a better country that is a heavenly one. Therefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God. Indeed, He has prepared a city for them. I think those last words really sum it up for us. Abraham considered that promised place, that unknown place, a better place, 
And that is why when he faced the tough parts of his journey and the struggles of faith, and when he faced the the fact that he didn't know where he would end up, that's why he was able to endure. If he had been thinking of that place that he was leaving behind, Hebrews says, he wouldn't have made it. But as it is, he continued on. By faith, he continued on the journey. And many others after him did the same. Therefore, God is not ashamed to call them, to, call, to be called their God. Indeed, he has prepared a city for them. We began this morning talking about expeditions to the, the Northwest Passage. We talked about the Franklin Expedition. When I think about the Franklin Expedition and I think about the things that they carried with them on their journey, it sure seems to me like they were thinking of the place that they had left behind them and so weighed down by this life that they were leaving behind them but trying to carry on with them, they had no strength to make it. They had no ability to endure and complete the journey into that difficult unknown place that they had set out to go. And I think that it's worth asking ourselves the question this morning and thinking about the things that we carry, the things that we carry with us on our journey and what they may say about the journey that we are on. Sometimes I wonder, and you know this is very convicting to me actually personally, but I wonder sometimes If we appear to God like the Franklin expedition appears to us, like we're so weighed down with so many things that don't last or that don't truly matter or that don't help us to make it further on our journey, we get so weighed down with these things that it saps our strength to move forward. I wonder sometimes if God, in God's eyes, looks at us and and sees the people who are so weighed down completely with the things of this life we say we're leaving behind, that it's not really clear which place we think is the better country. I wonder if there's anything at all, anything in the world except faith that could set us freely moving with full purpose and full heart in full pursuit of the God that we love. I think that there's a reason that this chapter in Hebrews ends the way that it does. As it spills on into chapter 12, it ends with a challenge for you and me, and let this be our challenge for this week, and let this be our challenge as a church. Since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, chapter 12, let us lay aside every weight and the sin that clings so closely to us, let us set aside those things, those burdens, those sins that weigh us down, and let us run the race that is set out before us. Let us journey on toward the promise that God has given us, looking to Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy set before Him endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. The message is simple, but it's not easy. And I wonder this morning, maybe today you're you're listening and you're realizing that your life has become so weighed down with these things, whatever they may be, that you're not running the race like you should or that you want to. Maybe it's time in your life to repent of those sins that cling so closely to us. Maybe it's time to relinquish those worries that weigh down upon us so heavily. Maybe it's time for a change of schedule. Maybe it's time for a change of priorities in your life to put your faith and your journey toward home in the place that matters most. As we leave this place today and as we sing our last song today, we've chosen for this morning a song of resolve to put those things behind us that get in the way of approaching God and to run the race that is set out before us with full faith that the promises of God are sure and that we can trust in Him to take care of us. 
as we leave today, as Gary mentioned earlier, we do have an invitation that is available to all. The invitation of God. If you, if you need today to commit your life to Christ and start the journey to be baptized, we want to offer that opportunity today. Or as you leave today, as you find the elders at the doors, as you leave the auditorium today, if there's a burden on your heart or on your life, help us to share in that burden with you so that we can all journey towards God in faith more freely and more fully. Whatever the case may be, my hope is that you keep the faith. My prayer is that you'll take the steps forward, seeking God with the kind of faith that moves you to action and that moves you toward home. Let's live as faithful people this week as we leave this place and as together we stand and as we sing.